Okay, get ready for my ultimate guide to baking. Whether it's breads, cakes, tarts, pies or pastries, baking is one of the most seductive skills in the kitchen. It fills the house with fantastic aromas and puts irresistible food on the table. Now, I'm going to put you on the road to bacon nirvana, starting with an easy bread packed with big, gutsy flavours, olive, tomato and rosemary focaccia. I absolutely love bacon bread. There's something really satisfying about doing it. And this focaccia recipe is very hands-on, but the end result is something really, really tasty. First off, start with the dough. Tip 500 grams of strong bread flour into a mixing bowl and add 20 grams of semolina. That gives the focaccia its sort of rustic charm. Now, there's one thing focaccia needs. It's really good seasoning. You can't season bread after it's baked, so it's got to go in right at the very beginning. Sprinkle in 15 grams of dried yeast. Take some warm water and then 50 mils of olive oil. Top up that water. That gives it this really nice, silky, rich texture. Make a little well. Mix up that yeast, water, and oil in. Start off with the fingers. Keep the fingers nice and open. It's like a little sort of whisk going in there. I'm looking for a really nice sort of relaxed dough. Now, that's just starting to come together. Touch more water. With the oil in there, give it a little swirl. And in again. The secret is to sort of knead it gently. Don't overwork it. It's a sort of easy bread to make, a nice one to start off with when you're making bread for the first time. Basically, kneading means just knit it together. Just hanging. Lightly flour your board, and let's just knead that focaccia into a nice, smooth dough. Make sure you don't over-add too much flour, otherwise it sort of dries out the dough. Something quite magical about making bread, you can switch off and lose yourself. My first job for a three mission star establishment was a baker. I was 22 years of age and I used to start at midnight. I was under such a tight schedule. One o'clock, white bread done. Two o'clock, brown bread. Three o'clock, sourdough. Four o'clock, cheese bread. Five o'clock, prove, bake. Six o'clock, crack them open and taste. It was amazing. Beautiful. Look at that. Looks stunning. It hasn't even risen yet. Leave your dough to rise in a warm place till it's doubled in size. We call this proving. Look at that. Beautiful. A lot of chefs sort of need it for the second time, but I'm looking for a really nice, light, aerated focaccia. Take a tray. Touch of olive oil in there. Season it at the bottom. Really important. That's the exciting thing about a focaccia. You've got that really nice sort of salty top and salty bottom. And then just with a touch of olive oil on your hands, gently push that in and almost massage it into the corners. It's possible to put sort of olives and tomatoes and garlic through the dough, but it never really allows the dough to sort of aerate properly when you put so much ingredients in. I'm going to stick mine on top, use your finger and sort of just push them in. Some salt on top, some pepper on top as well. I want some nice, fresh, amazing rosemary. Just hold the stalk and just pull off and then just sprinkle down. Generous on the rosemary. Really important to have that nice fragrance on top of the focaccia. Finish it off before it goes in with a little drizzle of olive oil. So it almost sinks in those little pockets of flavour, olive, tomato, rosemary and olive oil into the oven. Bake your focaccia at 200 degrees for 30 to 35 minutes. Beautiful. Mm. Smells delicious. Beautiful. You can hear how crispy that is. You can't beat a nice, warm, fresh slice of home-cooked focaccia. It's rustic, charming, and it's the perfect way to start baking, making homemade focaccia. It's so addictive. Mm -hmm. 
getting to grips with bacon is just a matter of confidence. And once you've grasped the basics, then the possibilities are limitless. Here are three more of my favourite super simple bread recipes to get you going. Kicking off with my simple soda bread. First up, measure out your dry ingredients. Plain flour, wholemeal flour, salt, caster sugar, and bicarbonate of soda. Mix, get 450 ml of buttermilk, pour most of it in and combine. Buttermilk has a wonderful, subtle, sour note that gives this bread a deliciously different taste. You can get it in most of the big supermarkets. If your dough's a bit stiff, add the rest of your buttermilk. Flour your board. Gently knead the mixture for about 30 seconds until it's all combined. Dust your baking tray. Place your dough in the center and score a deep crust with a knife to get a perfect crust. Then simply bake in a preheated oven for 30 to 35 minutes. Amazingly easy, absolutely delicious and foolproof. Hot, crusty, homemade soda bread whenever you want. My next no-sweat bread recipe is even faster to make. Quick flatbreads with lemon, thyme and ricotta. For the dough mix, first slice a leek lengthwise and chop. And saute in a pan with hot olive oil and butter till tender. Season. Next, combine flour with a pinch of seasoning and olive oil. And mix in your cooked leeks. Bring the dough together in a bowl with a drop of warm water. Cover and rest for 20 minutes. Allowing the dough mixture to relax means the resulting bread will be nice and soft. Then dust the dough with flour. Mold into a sausage shape. Slice it into rounds. And flatten with a rolling pin. Then simply fry in a hot, dry pan. When golden and crisp on each side, Remove. For a simple supper, serve with ricotta cheese, lemon zest, and fresh thyme. So simple, so fast, and so versatile, flatbreads to die for. Next, how to make one of the world's most popular bread-based foods fast. Mozzarella and rosemary pizza. For the pizza dough, add yeast to warm water. Put in a tablespoon of sugar and lead to one side. In a separate bowl, add sieve flour. Make a well and add your olive oil and yeast mixture. Get your hands right in to bring it together. Then knead for about 10 minutes on a floured surface until even and smooth. Put back into the bowl, cover and leave in a warm place to prove. Once it's roughly doubled in size, knock any excess air out. Place back on your surface, divide your dough into four balls, and simply flatten. Add olive oil to a hot pan and put in the pizza dough. Pizza is usually cooked in a seriously hot oven, but this pan cook method works brilliantly. As the dough starts to bubble and the base turns golden, spoon over tomato passata, which is sieved tomatoes and tear in chunks of mozzarella. Then simply transfer to a hot grill until golden and bubbly. Finish with fresh rosemary. I love this classic combination, but you can easily adapt it and add your own favorite topping for a perfect pizza in minutes. So simple, so fast, so irresistible. Three recipes that'll change the way you think about homemade bread forever. Beautiful. Whether I'm doing a simple sponge cake or making an elaborate tart, I want my baking to be the best it can be. So I always start with the best ingredients I can find. Knowledge is crucial. The more you know personally about where your ingredients are from and how they're produced, the better. Flour. 
To get the lowdown on one of the key ingredients to brilliant baking, it always pays to ask an expert. And if there's one man who can really rise to the occasion, it's professional miller, Mark Abel. Doing a job like this means that you end up thinking and living flour. If that's obsession, I'm obsessed. At his mill, which has stood in Norfolk since 1835, Mark uses traditional stones to grind his flour, so he really knows his stuff. What actually comes off the field is something like this. Still husked, still needs to be processed before we can actually mill it. We then clean down to something like this, which is ready to be milled. All this is is a great big machine, which means you don't have to do it by hand. Rather than try and improve its performance by adding additional chemicals, what we're trying to do is mill it in the best way to get that performance from it. If you can put a seed in between stones, you can make flour out of it. Uh, it's that simple. Barley was what was traditionally used to, to make bread for people to live off. Oats can be used as well. And of course, good old spelt, the great grandmother of modern wheats, which has the most fantastic flavor and is, because of its primitive nature, the proteins in it are simpler. So a lot of people can eat that. They can't eat modern wheat. Keep your eyes on the shelves. Look and see what is there. And if something strikes you as being potentially interesting, then get it and try it. Mix your own, blend your own together so that you can get the flavor that you want with the performance that you want. Mark's right. Different flowers perform and taste wildly different, and so they're well worth trying out. Here's my quick guide to some of the flowers I like using. Strong flour is the one to choose for standard bread making. The higher the protein content, the crustier your loaf will be. The flour hailing from Italy, double zero. It's super finely milled and perfect for pasta. I like to use it for pizzas too, because it produces a nice crispy crust like the one on my mozzarella and rosemary version. Rye flour will give you really dense, fruity-flavoured bread, fruit cakes or scones. If it's too heavy for you, just mix it with standard wheat flour. And when you are baking, remember that self-raisin flour is just plain flour with raisin agents added. So if you run out, you can add baking powder and salt to your plain flour and get baking. That's the real stuff, that's it. Fresh flour straight out of the mill is so superior in flavour and performance that uh, it's only when you come to use it you realise what the difference is. If you're going to experiment with ingredients in baking, you still need to follow some basic rules to make sure things turn out brilliantly every time. Then, whether you're a master baker or you're just starting out, you can pimp up the classics, whether it's a Victoria sponge or a fruit scone. And that's the lesson perfectly illustrated by my next recipe, sponge with fresh ginger. Baking is part chemistry, part imagination but you've got to rely on the rules for great results. It's the only time you'll see me reaching for the scales. First off, eggs, sugar, butter. And when I say weigh out the ingredients, it does literally mean weigh out to the final gram, 175. Now, 175 grams of sugar. That's 350 grams in total. Cream, the butter and the sugar. To get a delicious, light sponge, start carefully on slow speed. Only speed up as the butter and sugar really start to cream together. Keep that really nice and light, and you can see how it's changed colour. So important at the beginning. Eggs in. Give them a little whisk. Adding one egg at a time stops the mix from separating. Second egg in. Third one in. That's what we're looking for, a really nice sort of light, aerated texture. Now, I'm going to flavour the sponge. A little teaspoon of vanilla extract. That perfumes the mix. One teaspoon of baking powder. That gives lightness. 175 grams of flour, and we're going to sieve it. A, to get rid of any lumps, and B, to keep it really nice and fine. 175. We're not going to beat that out. We're just going to lightly fold that in now. What I'm looking for is a really nice, loose dough. That's looking a little bit too firm, so just a little splash of milk, a couple of tablespoons. That relaxes the mixture down, helps create that nice, almost dropping consistency. That's what I want. 
just starting to drop. Take a non-stick loose bottom cake tin, grease it with butter, then coat it with flour to avoid the sponge sticking. Just give that a little shake. Make sure we get all the rim. Now, just get the back of the spatula. Make sure you've got no peaks on my sponge. To make sure the sponge bakes nice and evenly, tap the tin a few times to knock out any air pockets that might have formed in the mixture. Now, into the oven. Bake for 30 to 35 minutes at 180 degrees. As that's cooking, prepare the ginger cream for the centre. 300 ml of cream. Give that a nice whisk. Whisking the cream by hand gives you so much more control. And it's so easy to over whip cream. I want that nice, light ginger cream in the centre. I don't want it grainy. Nothing worse when cream starts to separate. Now, let's get into that three-quarter stage. And little stiff peaks. Stop that for two minutes. Fresh ginger. Now, get a really nice, large slice of ginger. It smells incredible. It's so fragrant. Peeling ginger is like sort of peeling a potato. Just take out all those little dark spots. Now, get your grater. If you haven't got a grater, you can chop the ginger really finely. I've got almost like a puree of ginger going through, but the juice as well. Take your knife and just scrape all that. And taste. Mmm, it's incredible. It's fragrant and it's not sweet. It's got that really nice taste. Set that in the fridge. Smells incredible. Run a knife around the outside to ensure the cake doesn't stick to the tin before turning it out. Now, get your hands under. Push up and out. While your cake cools, I'm going to do like a really nice, sweet chocolate coating. Pour 300 ml of double cream into a saucepan. Add two tablespoons of golden syrup to make the top nice and glossy. Then whisk. Chop this up really thinly so as it melts quickly. 50 grams of butter. That's going to give the chocolate a really nice shine. Boil your cream and mix it in. Give that a really good stir. As the chocolate and the butter melts, it thickens. Look how shiny that is. It's so nice to finish with something sweet on top. Topping done, time to build your sponge cake. Look at the halfway mark there and just gently slice and really take your time all the way through. Lift. Mm, that is delicious. That nice big dollop in the middle. Don't be stingy. Don't be tight with the cream. Another dollop on top. Spread that. Very carefully lift the lid and just sit that on top. That's why I start off with a little extra cream in there, so when I squash it down, the cream just pushes out to the side. I'm not finished. Pour the luxurious chocolate topping over the sponge. Be generous and make sure the cake is coated thoroughly to give it a gorgeous finish. Get the bottom of the ladle and spread. Whoa. One more. Whoa. You've got to know when to say stop and something looks that delicious. I just want to dive in there. Next, five more of my 100 tips to help you cook better. And of course, these are all about baking. Kicking off with how to whip cream. Whipping cream. Now, the important part here is whipping the cream to a three-quarter stage. If we over-whip it, it will split, so be very careful. Double cream in. Now, when we whisk things, we whisk it in the shape of a figure of eight. And if you spin the bowl as you whip the cream, you get to release it from the bottom, so it whips evenly. Whisk, whisk, whisk. And it should just sit inside the whisk and start to sort of fall out. Just perfect. Three-quarter stage, double cream, done. Room temperature cream whips much faster than cold, so you'll need to take your cream out of the fridge 30 minutes before you want to whip it. Unless, of course, you want to work on your biceps. A 
great tip to prevent milk and cream from boiling over in a saucepan is to simply lay a wooden spoon across the top. The cream bubbles will rise up and hit the wooden handle and then fall back into the pan instead of bubbling over. Sticky stuff like treacle and golden syrup can be a real mess to measure out. My tip is to rub the spoon with a neutral oil like rapeseed and any sticky ingredients will slide straight off. And my tip for greasing cake tins is to keep old butter wrappers on hand and use them to crease when needed. Follow my ultimate cookery course, packed with key lessons, top tips, and 100 recipes to stake your life on. And you'll literally be cooking yourself into a better chef. Many of these amazing recipes are on my app. Please check out the App Store for details. Go on. Get cooking.